Okay, so movie fans get this right. Indie romances, they're back. Like seriously, back from the brink. And horror sequels, they're breaking that curse. You know, the whole diminishing returns thing. Oh, and get this. One tiny little film just raked in a per theater average that honestly we haven't seen since like way back in those pre-pandemic times. Yeah, yeah. It's wild. This weekend's box office. <laughs> Total roller coaster. Let's uh let's dive into these numbers and try to figure out what's what's really going on here. What's got everyone talking? You know, the really fascinating thing here is it's not just those big budget, you know, the huge blockbuster films that are dominating the conversation right now. Right. What we're seeing is like a real genuine hunger for diverse storytelling, you know, yeah. and that's reflected in some pretty surprising whims, actually. Yeah, definitely some surprises. Yeah. Uh, let's kick things off with, well, the big grin in the room, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Smile 2. It just scared up a cool $23 million wow. for its opening weekend. I'm impressed. And get this, it even outperformed the original Smile. Which, honestly, that's a remarkable feat when you think about it. Right. Considering, you know, that kind of mixed track record that horror sequels tend to have. Yeah. Smile 2, it's like, it's tapped into something beyond just those jump scares, you know? Yeah. There's a real sense of unease there, a reflection of like maybe current societal anxieties. And I think that's resonating on a deeper level with audiences. Yeah, it's true. It's it's not just about the scares themselves, but it's what do those scares actually represent, right? Exactly. And speaking of representing Smile 2, saw a much broader audience than the first one, actually. 33%, 33% Latino and Hispanic viewership. So that shows you right there, this film's appeal, it's reaching beyond those, you know, the, the usual horror demographics. And you can't discount that social media buzz, right? All those, remember those creepy grin memes like flooding everyone's feeds a few weeks back? Yeah! That was brilliant marketing. They created this aura of anticipation and and let's be real, a little bit of dread. It's true. It's true. It's like they like hacked into our collective fear of contagious laughter and mm. turned it into box office gold. Genius. Cure genius. Uh, you know what? Enough about creepy grins. Okay. Let's talk about something a little more, you know, heartwarming. How about that? I like the sound of that. We live in time, okay? <laughs> This quiet little indie romance, it's proving that you don't need explosions and all those crazy special effects to draw a crowd. It's true. Exactly. And with a solid $4,300 per theater average, you know? That's pretty good. That's We live in time, like yeah. defying the odds there. Especially considering, you know, those challenges that indie films have been facing lately. It's, it's really something. They have. It really suggests that audiences, they're craving those character-driven stories, you know, <sighs> those intimate moments that, like, stay with you long after the credits roll. It's like finding that perfectly formed seashell, you know, wow. on a beach that's just littered with, well, let's just say less than perfect things. I like that. And, and with a 98% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, yep. it's clear that we live in time is really, it's striking a chord with people. Yeah, and I think it challenges that whole notion that audiences only want escapism. You yeah. know, sometimes they actually want to be drawn into a world that feels real, relatable, even if it means confronting, you know, kind of some more complex emotions. It's true. Speaking of complex emotions, let's talk about Enora. This film is making serious waves right now. I've heard about this. And incredible. Get this. $105,000 per theater average. Watch. The second highest since, you know, those, those dark days, the theater closing days of the pandemic. Oh, wow. Really something. And for a film that's only playing on six screens. It's tiny. That's, that's astounding. Yeah. To put that into perspective, most limited releases, they'd be thrilled to hit even half that amount. Right, right. So Honora's success. It suggests a huge demand for this boundary-pushing kind of storytelling, mm -hmm. even among, you know, a smaller, more niche audience. It's like it's like finding, like, a rare vintage record and realizing it's worth a fortune. So we've got audiences craving those scares with Smile, too, seeking those heartfelt connections in We Live in Time. And now with Enora, they're clearly hungry for these stories that you know, kind of push the envelope. Absolutely. They want to see something different. But before we before we get too caught up in these, you know, these indie darlings, there's there's an animated film that's kind of defying expectations in its own lane, so to speak. You're talking about the wild robot, right? Yeah. Because it's in its fourth weekend and it's like still pulling the, the ground. Exactly. Through. It's really unusual for an animated film, actually. Yeah. Usually they like, you know, they make this big splash opening weekend yeah. and then the numbers just kind of you know, they, they dwindle, right? Yeah, they kind of fade. 
But the wild robot, it's got staying power, like yeah. serious staying power. It does. It's on track to hit $102.3 million by Sunday. Wow. What I think is so interesting about that is the wild robot seems to be benefiting from like this perfect storm of all these positive factors. Yeah. Like, well, strong word of mouth, right? Oh, yeah. The parents telling all their friends. Kids are telling their classmates. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of genuine enthusiasm. That's, yeah. That's marketing gold right there. You just... You can't buy that. Right. And and let's not forget, there really isn't a ton of competition in that family film arena right now. True. Very true. So the wild robot is really like capitalizing on that gap, right? Mm -hmm. Offering audiences that really, truly heartfelt story that appeals to, you know, both kids and their and their parents, you know, the grownups. Yeah. It really speaks to this broader trend we've been seeing audiences they're they're craving quality, right? Yeah. They're willing to to seek out those films that offer something different, something meaningful. Yeah. Even if it means, you know, venturing beyond those big budget special effects laden blockbusters. It's it's like the difference between, you know, a, a sugary cereal okay. and like a really hearty home cooked breakfast, right? Yeah. Sometimes you just you crave something with a little more, you know, substance. Yeah, absolutely. But before we get too cozy with our with our robot friends, let's let's jump into some other notable releases from the weekend. Okay, yeah. Let's do it. Let's do a quick rundown. Quatre. You know, the wins, maybe some surprises. Okay. And maybe even a head scratcher or two in there. Okay, let's do it. All right. First up we've got Terrifier Three holding its own with a uh, with a bloody good 36.7 million dollars at the box office. Nice. Not bad, not bad at all for an independent horror film, right? Not bad at all. And I think it just shows that there's like this real appetite for horror yeah. that that pushes those boundaries, right? Yeah. Especially within that kind of niche market. It's true. Terrifier 3 has really managed to like cultivate this loyal following. Those fans, they are Hungry, hungry yeah. for that 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 brand of over the top gore. And then you've got you know the ghost with the most uh -huh. Beetlejuice two still still kicking it in its seventh weekend. Uh huh. That's um, amazing. What a testament to, you know, the enduring appeal of that film. Right? Yeah. Beetlejuice two proves that a healthy dose of nostalgia, combine that with some really clever writing and and a really unique visual style, you can make a sequel connect with audiences like right. decades after the original. Yeah, it's like that, you know, comfy old sweater you break out every fall. I love those. Familiar, but you know what I mean. It still holds a certain like charm, you know. I get you. But speaking of charm, Goodrich, despite some really actually positive buzz, it seems to have stumbled a bit out of the gate, don't you think? Yeah, yeah. And and this is where we see that that flip side of the box office coin, right? Right. Even with a decent, you know, 93% positive audience rating. Yeah, it's not bad. Goodrich didn't quite find its footing. Yeah, it, it really makes you wonder, right? Like, did the marketing miss the mark somehow? Yeah. Was it just, like, bad timing? Yeah, it happens. I don't know. Sometimes. Even with all the right pieces, you know? Wow. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't quite... Does it connect? It doesn't connect, yeah. It's a good reminder, though, that box office success, it's its really a combination of factors, you know, some that a filmmaker can control, but then others that are just, well... A little unpredictable. A little, yeah, a little unpredictable. But hey, as we as we kind of wrap up our, our deep dive here into this week's box office, like, what are the big takeaways for you? Hmm. What does it all mean, you know, for us, for us movie fans? Well, I think this week has been a really fascinating study in contrasts, wouldn't you say? Definitely has been. We saw those horror franchises, you know, <laughs> tapping into some really, some really deep societal anxieties. Yeah. And those indie romances, they're reminding us of the power of just human connection. It's true. And even those animated films proving that these these heartwarming stories, they can still find an audience, you know? It's been, it's been a real mixed bag, honestly. And I, I kind of, I kind of love that, actually. Yeah, it's refreshing. It suggests, I don't know, like a real shift in the cinematic landscape, don't you think? Yeah. A move away from the kind of the predictable, you know. Yeah. And towards something something a little more diverse, you know, a little more nuanced kind of storytelling. And that is exciting, I think, for, for everyone involved, right? So too. For filmmakers, it means taking more risks, pushing those creative boundaries. Definitely. And really, really trusting that that audiences out there are ready for something different. I think they are. I do too. And for and for those moviegoers, for us, right? Yeah. 
it just opens up like this whole world of possibilities, you know, a chance to explore genres maybe we haven't haven't really delved into before. Yeah, discover those hidden gems. I love those, and even and even challenge our own you know preconceived notions about about what a film should be, you know? It's true, yeah. I, I love that. So, you know, you out there listening, as you as you head out to the theater this week, just just remember, right, it's not it's not just about the numbers. Right. It's about the stories that those numbers represent. Yeah, so dive into a good story this week, all right. What speaks to you? What what sparks your curiosity? What are you craving? Exactly. No, dive into that that creepy grin. Let yourself be be swept away by by a heartfelt romance. Or, or lose yourself completely in, in a world of, of animated wonder. It's true, yeah. The beauty of film is that like, there really is something out there for everyone. There is. And on that note, thanks for joining us on this deep dive. We'll catch you next time.